Jonathan Gullis, good afternoon, sir. How are you? Hey, I'm Jeremy. How are you doing? Really good to have you on. Welcome. First guest on the new show, JG. Appreciate that. Um, well, mate, what? I'm honoured. I went to Sam's Barber's in Tunstall to get a special trim just for you. That's Did how you? Yeah. special you are. You were conned. Did you pay for that? Was it free? Oh, no, he's, he's a very good guy. He's a very good guy. <laughs> Don't you dare talk badly about Sam. I know why you've mentioned it, to save paying. Right, listen, just very quickly, so much to start. Let, let, let's start, if you're all right, with Hamza Yusuf, uh, resigning today as, as, as Scotland's First Minister. Can I just... Let's, before we talk about the Greens and the SNP... Let me throw something out there that I said to somebody the other day. There are thousands of people north of the border who paid their £5 to join the SNP when Nicola Sturgeon was at the controls who fervently believed in, in independence, and that's what they wanted. I would feel so cheated, Jonathan Gullis, if I was one of them, one of those people who'd really believed in it. And you look at the SNP now. Peter Morell, Nicola Sturgeon's husband, charged with fraudulent behaviour. She had to resign in, well, what appears to be disgrace, more of that anon. And today, Humsey Eustace has to resign. I mean, the SNP, talk about a meteoric rise. It's been an unbelievable disaster, hasn't it, my friend? Well, I think you say it correctly when you call him Humsey Eustace, because that's what he has exactly been during his tenure. You know, it's, this is the man who still wanted to pursue this idea that a trans woman is a woman and allow these men who have identified as women who are prisoners, who have convicted rape, into women's prisons, which should have put vulnerable women at risk. This is a man who also has introduced some archaic laws that means that simply saying something around the dinner table can now get you arrested and then led to actually 4,000 I think plus complaints of his own words being spoken in Holyrood being reported to the police which is clogging up police time and a waste of space and ultimately let's be frank he decided to jump before he was pushed he was on the way out and he realized that he has uh, had to go mm. but ultimately for the SNP as you say Jeremy I think they're in such disarray they're in such a mess that ultimately the case for unionism, the case for a united United Kingdom has never been stronger. And this is good news for all unionist parties across the House, regardless of whether they're Labour, Conservative or Liberal Democrat, because this is a good day to make sure that our country can come together. And the SNP, I suspect, are going to have to go and do some very deep soul searching because the uh, I see the front runner, John Sweeney, was also a disaster, particularly in education, where Scotland has plummeted down international league tables. But that's the and other so I thing. Think if the SNP think they're going to replace... We know one bad egg yeah. with another bad egg, then you know. Well, they did. They they did. They replaced Sturgeon with with Hamza Yusuf. The point that I don't understand is people get so fixated, don't they, JG, on 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 independence, which the SNP, whatever they say, has not delivered. If you look at some of the structure in Scotland, you speak to some of the people I've spoken to over the last few years who live in Scotland. They talk about the health service. They talk about job opportunities. They talk about the things that a government and a first minister should be concentrating on. Absolutely nothing at all. Hasn't been concentrating on that at all. And as you say, has fallen on. His saw before before he's got rid of and 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 it'll be really interesting to see what's that of course that's a massive battleground in the next election isn't it because the labor party presumably it's a big battle for the tory party your party because the labor party used to be dominant in scotland that is probably apart from the red war one of the big areas that will make a massive difference isn't it oh look absolutely labor <clears throat> concern we'll be looking at how we can win back in over in scotland and increase our numbers obviously we're very lucky to have some outstanding excellent colleagues in the in scotland both in holyrood and down in westminster and i think we'll have a very strong case going forward because ultimately whilst the snp have been busy virtue signaling to the green extremists about wanting to end uh, drilling in the north sea which was thousands tens of thousands of jobs in scotland it's the scottish conservatives who have been demanding that those jobs are protected and that we do indeed use our own natural resources when the scottish uh, when the snp want to introduce these as i say bizarre laws around free speech well actually anti-free speech mm. it's the scottish conservatives have been vocal and again it's the scottish conservatives motion that, uh, to have no confidence in humza yusuf that ended up with him having to fall on his sword just as they did the same with nicola sturgeon earlier so i think that my colleagues both in holyrood and in westminster are doing a very good cause for the Conservative and Unionist Party that we're proud to be part of. It'll be very interesting because Craig Coy, a party chairman of the Scottish Conservatives, is on the show ahead of five o'clock. Let's move on to uh, Ireland. You probably get this more than me, JG, but there's real, uh, real arguments this morning that migrants, according to your boss, put off by the Rwanda deal, are heading to Northern Ireland and making their way into the Republic of Ireland. The Republic of Ireland have jumped up and gone, hold on a second, you need to take them back, to which Rishi Sunak, finally, Jonathan Gullis, and I'm sure you're going to tell me you're behind this, is standing up and saying, oh, 
hold on a minute, why are we always the soft touch? Why are we paying France £500 million a year? I'll tell you what, why don't you take some back? And all the people that jump up and down and say, yes, these are human beings. And let's make the point, let's be f perfectly honest. There are people who are genuine refugees, as I've said repeatedly on every single show I've done, right? There are. Look how this country behaved over Ukraine. But there are people criminals, criminal gangs and people coming to this country who will benefit, give us no benefits and take advantage. And these people need to be sent home. And I, I, I see again today, first show, I see this as a really seminal moment for Uchisuna, don't you? Oh, absolutely. I think the Prime Minister is entirely right to make the case loud and clear that if our European neighbours, our direct neighbours in this case, want to stop the boats just as we want to, then ultimately deals are going to have to be done, which means that we will have the ability to return those who illegally cross the channel uh, to enter this country back to France. Because if you do that, if you take away the operational model of the smuggling gangs, then who's going to put tens of thousands of pounds in those gangs' hands in the first place, which means that smugglers won't be able to convince people to travel their way up to northern France in order to get across because people will know there is no point. So it benefits the French, it benefits us, and it will therefore ultimately benefit, benefit Ireland. And I do find it quite ironic that the Irish government is willing to basically try and demand, force people to return back across the border, which in essence creates a hard border. The very thing they have said, yep. time and again related to Brexit, would put the Good Friday Agreement at risk and would undermine peace on, that, on those shores. So, you know, I think it's time that they ate some humble pie and realised that actually... Than, rather than virtue signaling as they did for years under with Varadka in charge, then now we can actually have that common sense approach. But ultimately, by people choosing to go into the Republic of Ireland, that just tells you everything you need to know. Rwanda is and will be a deterrent. Want even more so once we get those flights I, off. I the would ground. say. I would say one. I would say one thing. I would say. Hear me out. I would. I would say. JJ, I would say one thing, right? Whether you support Rwanda or you don't, and I have reservations in only how much it's cost and, and, and what it might or might not achieve. I do think, I, and, I, and I've said this from day one, there's 170, nearly 180,000 people in a backlog system. We need to process these people. Can I move on? By the way, hello to Mickey. says, brilliant. Eustace is gone. Uh, Roly next, please. Be woke in the pack and get the sacks. Says Mickey, who's loving the, the brand new sound of talk. He says, common sense is finally back, which is good to hear. Um, here's... Here's a, here's a theory. They're all going to frown at me. Um, Rishi Sunak accuses benefit claimants of gaming the system. I heard the excellent Mel Stride work in pension secretary on Mike Graham's Morning Glory this morning. And, and Mel Stride was saying, look, it's about time. We acknowledge that there are many people who are disabled and, 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 and down on their luck. And, and maybe, you know, there is mental illness as well. These people are on benefits. But we also need to acknowledge that there are many people using this system. So I had this theory. I put it to you, JG, right? This is what I don't understand. We, we have, say, the National Health Service, and I get told that migration is important. This started under Blair because these very people fill the jobs in the NHS as porters and, and they, they, the dinner ladies and dinner men and all those sorts of people. And here's what I'm thinking. If there's three million people unemployed, let's say a million are mentally ill and millions are disabled and mentally ill, I'll accept that, but not three million, not in a million years. Why doesn't the government make the two million people who we're paying benefits to get some training or some impetus to go and fill the jobs that we're getting migrants from another country to do? Because presumably we'd save money, man. Well, look, absolutely, Jeremy. That's why the Prime Minister in, a, in the last two weeks has made a number of speeches and uh, interventions where we're going to start clamping down much, tightly, much more tightly on people who have obviously been gaming the system, as he rightly says. Look, I think since COVID, we've seen a monthly average working age uh, individual uh, PIP claim, sorry, uh, more than double. And this is just completely unacceptable. This will be £28 billion a year from 2028, 29 in just disability benefits alone if we don't sort this problem. And I think that Mel Stride and the Prime Minister are bang on when they say, actually, there are a lot of people who maybe don't need cash but actually need support. So let's give them mental health treatment rather than just giving them money. Let's allow people to get a grant to adapt their home to make it more friendly or accessible for those with certain disabilities rather than like you and I said, just giving money hand over fist, which is do giving you, no incentive. Do you understand? To the but, JG, do you understand the frustration? Listen, you, you're on this station, you're talking to people who want common sense. There's a lot of people, right? Uh, frustrated Tory voters. And they would say, hold on a second, we're now talking about people gaming the benefit system. We're now talking about being stronger on migration. We're now talking about tax cuts. Why has it taken your party? It's a fair comment on this. Why has it seemingly taken your party until we're, what, six months to an election to finally be on the front foot? Because I I've sat and I've watched the Tories on the back foot for so long. Why haven't they been more vocal 
and more forward thinking with these things? Look, I think it's a very fair question, Jeremy. And ultimately, the Prime Minister, when he took over in November 2022, did so under very difficult circumstances, with the immediate focus being on the need to support households with their energy bills, of which the average household saw 50% of those uh, bills covered. Of course, they didn't see it maybe in person, but that money, £100 billion, was spent. This is the same Prime Minister also who spent £400 billion protecting people's lives and livelihoods with like things like the furlough scheme, as well as the, uh, obviously, COVID grants that went to many small, medium-sized businesses that are on our high streets, let alone... Uh, across our great nation. And so ultimately, I think that the Prime Minister has had to ride that turbulent storm, as many nations across the world has done. But now we're starting to see the green shoots of recovery. We're seeing inflation well below half, which the Prime Minister himself set as a target. We're seeing debt starting to fall as a percentage of GDP. We saw the economy grow and it's seemingly coming back very strongly from what was a short-term technical recession. So ultimately, we are going in the right direction, and that gives us the space and the ability to focus on the things that matter to your fine listeners, as well as the great people that I play and represent in places like Stoke-on-Trent North, Kids Grevin Talk, who want common sense, who want government to be compassionate but fair. That means making sure that those who are able to work do work, and those who can't, they get the support that they need. But if we're just if we're bailing out everyone under the sun, then ultimately that support, Great. that financial aid, will be spread much more thinly. Which means those who are in desperate need, those who deserve it more than anyone else, are not able to get the level of support they deserve. And that's why we're being the compassionate One Nation Conservative Party that I'm proud to be a member of. Final question for you. You're going to love this. One point four, no, fourteen billion, fourteen billion quid potholes cost the UK economy. You've only got ten seconds, Jonathan Gulledge. How many compensation claims relating to vehicle damage took place in your constituency in the last? year? I think in Stoke on Trent it was something like uh, 500 or 1,000. 1,308. You need to put some money towards that. We're always delighted to have you on. Jonathan Gullis, Deputy Chairman of the Tory Party.